Hi, and welcome back to my series of videos for Physical Chemistry 1. In the last video, we looked at how the entropy can be calculated for a variety of limiting cases. Isothermal processes, adiabatic processes, constant volume processes, and constant pressure processes. Entropy is one of the most important thermodynamic properties of a chemical process, and in future videos we'll learn a lot about a process by considering the entropy in combination with other thermodynamic properties like the enthalpy and energy. For that reason, this is a good time for us to review what we've learned about those other thermodynamic properties. To set the stage, let's draw a plot showing how the pressure and volume change during a process. We'll put the pressure on the y-axis and volume on the x. Now suppose our system starts out at a particular pressure, volume, and temperature, which we'll indicate on the plot using a point labeled P1, V1, T1. Now let's say we change the system reversibly, and in a way so that the pressure and volume change, but we hold the temperature constant. Because the temperature is constant, we refer to a change like this as an isothermal process. As you saw in video 9, a plot of P versus V at constant temperature gives us a curve called an isotherm. And for an ideal gas, it looks like this. Let's think about how the heat, work, energy, and enthalpy change when we perform this isothermal process. First, let's look at the energy. You might remember that during video 14, we saw this equation for the energy of an ideal gas. This equation features the number of moles, the temperature, and the degrees of freedom in our molecules. However, in our situation, all of these things are constant. The number of moles and degrees of freedom don't change in our gas, and since this is an isothermal process, T is constant too. That means the energy won't change, so the energy change is zero. For the systems we study using the ideas of thermodynamics, we use the symbol delta U for the change in energy, not delta E. Meanwhile, we have this equation for the enthalpy. As we just mentioned, delta U is zero, and the number of moles of gas aren't changing, so delta H is equal to zero too. So, for an isothermal process, both the change in energy and enthalpy are zero. Next, let's look at the work. Back in video 15, we saw that the work for a reversible process can be expressed using this equation, so we can calculate the work too. What about the heat? Well, we don't have an equation for the heat, but we do have this equation, which we learned is a way of expressing the first law of thermodynamics. But wait, we already know that the energy for this process is equal to zero, so that means the heat and work must be equal to each other, but opposite in sign. So, our expression for heat is just the negative of the expression we got for the work. Note that this is only true for an isothermal process. Our equations for heat and work will be different if other kinds of processes are used. So, now we have expressions for all four of our thermodynamic properties for an isothermal case. What if we hold something other than temperature constant? How will these properties be different then? To begin, let's go back to this plot. Suppose we change the system from the beginning to the ending state again, but this time we don't do it using an isothermal process. Instead, we'll use a two-step process. First, we'll change all three of the basic properties, the pressure, the volume, and temperature, in step one. However, notice that we'll make the final volume the same as it was in the first example. Since we changed all three of those parameters, what property are we holding constant? In this case, we'll actually hold the heat constant. We could do that, for example, by performing the process in a well-insulated container so that no heat could be exchanged with the surroundings. Just as a constant temperature process is referred to as isothermic, a constant heat process is called an adiabatic process. So, let's try to find expressions for the energy, enthalpy, heat, and work for an adiabatic process. The heat is easy. Since the heat is constant, Q is equal to zero. What about the energy? 
Well, you might recall this equation from the last video. The constant volume heat capacity of a gas is equal to the change in energy with respect to the temperature. We can solve this for du if we multiply both sides of the equation by dt. Now we can convert this to delta u by taking the integral of the right side of the equation. The integral will have upper and lower limits of t2 and t1. If the heat capacity is constant with temperature, we can pop it out of the integral, which gives us Cv delta t for the energy. So that's our equation for delta u. There are two things to notice about the integral we had before we got to the end. First, if the heat capacity is not constant with temperature, we'll need to leave it in the integral and find an expression for the relationship between heat capacity and temperature. That's likely something that will need to be determined experimentally. Second, notice that we derive this equation using the constant volume heat capacity, even though this process didn't occur at a constant volume. That's okay. The constant volume heat capacity is a property of a substance, like its density or boiling point. So Cv obeys this equation even when the system we're studying isn't at constant volume. So now we have expressions for Q and delta U for an adiabatic process. Next, let's look at the work. We know that delta U is equal to the heat plus the work. Since the heat change is equal to zero for an adiabatic process, that means that the expression for work is the same as the one for delta U. Finally, let's look at the enthalpy, delta H. For enthalpy, we can perform a calculation similar to the one we did for delta U. We had this equation for the constant pressure heat capacity in the last video. The constant pressure heat capacity of a gas is the change in enthalpy with respect to the temperature. We can solve this for dh by multiplying both sides of the equation by dt. Now we can convert this to delta h by taking the integral of the right side of the equation. The integral will have upper and lower limits of t2 and t1. If the heat capacity is constant with temperature, we can pop it out of the integral, which gives us cp delta t for the enthalpy. Before we move on, there's one more thing to know about adiabatic processes. Notice that even though the heat is constant, the temperature does change. It turns out that for a monatomic ideal gas like helium or xenon, the temperature at the beginning and end of a process are related to the volume using this equation. Notice that this is different from the connection between temperature and volume expressed by Charles's law. This is because Charles's law is valid when the pressure is constant, but that's not the situation here. In an adiabatic process, the pressure is not constant. For example, suppose a sample of neon behaving like an ideal gas at 150 degrees Celsius expands from 12.0 liters to 18.0 liters. What's the final temperature of the gas under conditions of constant pressure and what's the final temperature if it's an adiabatic process? First, let's try this for a process at constant pressure. In this case, we'll use Charles's law, which is this. We need to convert the temperature to Kelvin, but when we do, here's the equation we need to solve. When we solve it, we get a result of 635 Kelvin, which is 362 Celsius. Now let's try it for an adiabatic process. We'll use this equation and plug in our data. When we solve for T2, we find out that it's 323 Kelvin, or 49.8 Celsius. That's a huge difference, and one of the important differences you might notice between the constant pressure situation and the adiabatic one is that the temperature went up at constant pressure, but it went down under adiabatic conditions. This is actually something you've experienced before. If you've ever sprayed a can of deodorant, you know that the gas is very cold when it comes out of the can, even though the can is at room temperature. That's because the gas in the can expands adiabatically as it emerges, 
And as we've just seen, the temperature of a gas decreases if it expands adiabatically. However, remember we can't use this equation for the gas in the deodorant can because this expression is only correct for monatomic ideal gases, and the gas in the deodorant isn't monatomic. Anyway, let's get back to this diagram. We've now got expressions for the heat, work, energy, and enthalpy for an isothermal process and for an adiabatic process. Next, let's look at a constant volume process, which will bring our final temperature, pressure, and volume to the same place as it was at the end of the first process we did. First, let's think about the work. Work is the negative of the pressure times the change in volume. So for a constant volume process, work must be equal to zero. Next, let's think about the energy. We saw earlier that the constant volume heat capacity is equal to du over dt, and we use that to get this equation. This is still correct, so delta u is equal to cv times delta t. Now let's look at the heat. We know from the first law of thermodynamics that delta u is equal to heat plus the work. Since the work is zero in this case, the heat must be the same as delta u. And last, we'll look at the enthalpy. Here again, we can use the same equation we saw earlier, where the constant pressure heat capacity is equal to dH over dt. As a result, we saw that dH is equal to Cp times delta t. Before we move on, notice that the adiabatic process, followed by the constant volume process, brought us to the same final state we arrived at earlier using an isothermal process. Let's compare the results we got from the isothermal process to the results we got from the two-step adiabatic and constant volume steps. For the energy, we got Cv delta T for the adiabatic process. In that case, the temperature changed from T1 to T2. So delta T is equal to T2 minus T1. Now for the constant volume process, delta U was again equal to Cv delta T, but in this case, the temperature changed from T2 to T1. So delta T is equal to T1 minus T2. That means the adiabatic and constant volume processes have a delta U that are the same number, but opposite in sign. So when we add them, the overall delta U is zero. Meanwhile, delta U for the isothermal case was also equal to zero. So we got the same result no matter which of the two paths we followed, the isothermal path or the path that combined adiabatic and constant volume steps. The fact that we got the same value for delta U demonstrates that the energy is not a path-dependent variable. Based on our discussion in video 15, recall that a property that doesn't depend on the path is called a state function, so energy is a state function. The same is true for delta H. We got Cp delta T for the adiabatic process, and in that case, the temperature changed from T1 to T2, so delta T was equal to T2 minus T1. For the constant volume process, delta H was equal to Cp delta T again, but in this case, the temperature changed from T2 to T1, so delta T was equal to T1 minus T2. That means the adiabatic and constant volume processes have a delta H that are the same number but opposite in sign, so when we add them, the overall delta H is zero. Meanwhile, delta H for the isothermal case was also equal to zero. So just as with delta U, we got the same result for delta H no matter which of the two paths we followed. The fact we got the same value for delta H demonstrates that enthalpy is another state function. What about the heat? For the adiabatic process, the heat was zero. And for the constant volume process, it was Cv delta T. However, for the isothermal path, the heat was nRT times the logarithm of V2 over V1. These are two very different calculations, and it's very unlikely that they'll result in the same number. 
So this shows that the heat exchange has a completely different value depending on which path we use to get from the initial state to the final state. That makes heat a path function rather than a state function. In a similar way, the work was equal to CV delta T for the adiabatic path and zero for the constant volume path. On the other hand, for the isothermal path, the work is equal to negative nRT times the logarithm of V2 over V1. Again, the work is very different depending on which of the paths we use to get from the initial state to the final state, so work is a path function. So, energy and enthalpy are state functions, which means they'll always have the same value no matter what path we take to get from the initial to the final state. But the heat and work have very different values depending on the path, so those are path functions. So far, we've looked at an isothermal process, where the temperature is held constant, an adiabatic process, where the heat exchange is zero, and a constant volume process. Finally, let's imagine a process in which it's the pressure that's constant. For the enthalpy, we can use the same equation we've had before. Delta H equals Cp times the change in temperature. Meanwhile, recall that by definition, the enthalpy is equal to the heat change at constant pressure. So for this constant pressure process, Q is the same as delta H. Now let's think about the work. For work, we can use the same expression we've seen before, negative P times delta V. And finally, the first law of thermodynamics tells us that the energy is equal to the heat plus the work. So we can plug in our values for heat and work, and we find that delta U equals delta H minus P delta V, which is an equation we also saw back in video 16. So, now we've reviewed ways we can calculate the energy, enthalpy, and other thermodynamic properties of chemical processes. We'll get plenty of practice using these relationships in class and in the homework and quizzes. In the next video, we'll tie this information together with what we know about the entropy to get some real practical insight into real-life reactions. I hope you'll join me for that. But until next time, have a good week!